looking for. Alrighty. And with that, I think we're going to kick off. Who wants to start today? I think we've got Mar Mariana. Why don't you start this morning? All right. It's over to you, my friend. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So today with us, we have uh, uh, Takuya. Uh, Takuya is a computer scientist uh, at the School of Environmental uh, Studies at uh, Nagoya University in, uh, in Japan. And uh, he has developed uh, machine learning based human activity recognition methods using multimodal sensors. Based on this experience, he, today we will talk about uh, his paper where he is uh, proposing uh, the idea of implementing artificial intelligence on biologging devices. And uh, um, he designed basically the algorithm of uh, animal activity recognition on board. One of the main points of the papers of the paper uh, published in uh, Communication Biology is that basically an accelerometer, which is a, a low cost, a very simple sensor, can be used to control the biologging uh, video, the, uh, the video camera basically uh, put on the biologging device, which is a high cost sensor. Uh, um, Basically, uh, the, this uh, uh, control is, is uh, triggered by detecting body movements that are characteristic of a specific behavior that we wanted to detect. In this case, for example, diving or, simple, or general uh, foraging. So this movement is activating the camera. The authors show how it is more efficient to activate a camera based on, uh, on the behavior of interest rather than uh, using a periodic sampling. Basically, so uh, to show this, um, the, um, to, to show basically that the data collected uh, on the accelerometer while the animal is uh, in, in, in the wild um, are actually, um, uh, it needed to be, they show basically that the data needed to be analyzed uh, on, uh, on board of the device and so trigger basically the, uh, the camera. So a substantial amount of work has been carried by the researchers to develop models to be used to detect the behaviors on board of individuals. The effectiveness of the method was then evaluated by using artificial intelligence. Um, there is this uh, um, um, word that is uh, uh, written in the paper, artificial intelligence on animal based camera control on board of basically 10 biologists that then were attached on the black tail gulls. So um, along with, uh, with this artificial intelligence uh, um, on animal, uh, other uh, uh, biologging devices were also uh, attached on, uh, on uh, um, on other, uh, on other individuals. Uh, some uh, had uh, three, uh, three uh, devices were deployed using also a naive method where the camera basically uh, was having a peri periodic uh, sampling to control basically with, uh, with the triggering, uh, with the triggering uh, um, uh, setting, uh, setting. And uh, um, uh, these, uh, uh, these devices recorded the one minute duration videos. The training data used for the artificial intelligence was collected uh, at the same colony in 2017 using uh, uh, just uh, uh, accelerometers. And uh, uh, the artificial intelligence was then trained to detect the possible foraging behaviors basically based on the accelerometer data. So in the study, the authors uh, are proposing uh, uh, a method which is uh, um, Basically, based on uh, on the random forest, on the on the supervised machine learning method, the random forest, and uh, um, which is basically generating uh, decision tree decision tree classifiers that can fit on uh, on the devices that have limited memory. So this was one of the most uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges. So to run an onboard analysis that uh, um, um, on a, on a device with a limited basically uh, uh, memory. So random forest, as I said, is a supervised machine learning method based on a decision tree algorithm. And uh, random forest basically builds uh, uh, multiple decision tree, uh, trees and uh, merges them together to get quite a, a, um, an accurate and stable, uh, and stable pre um, prediction. The method uh, uh, that is proposed here modifies the original random forest. And basically what, uh, uh, what the authors are proposing is to basically make a, a weighted random selection when uh, choosing the, uh, the variables, which are called the features, um, we, when using the, uh, the variables to then uh, um, the variables to be used in, the, in, uh, in random forest. And then they compare each set 
of a tree, basically. So you can see, you can actually see this in the in the figure 4a of the of the paper, which illustrates very well how this selection is. Uh, um, is, uh, is made. So the method is assigned to uh, a weight to each, uh, uh, to each feature uh, that is basically proportional to the inverse of its size. And for size, uh, I mean how much memory it is occupying on the, um, on the biologging, on the biologging uh, device. And then uh, it calculates um, basically how, um, how much memory it would take to run this, uh, this tree. And uh, um, it makes basically a decision based uh, on the cost of the running algorithm on board of the tag, so in memory size and its accuracy. So, uh, uh, Takuya, uh, welcome uh, with us. Hi. Um, hi, I have some initial uh, questions uh, for you. So, um, in general, I have so you have used the cameras and uh, um, and the accelerometers and the uh, GPS as a general guideline for researchers working with different biologging uh, devices. I understand uh, from your methods uh, section that. Uh, um, you uh, that uh, of course you know you knew already that the camera had a delay with uh, with uh, with too. other sensor yes um, and so knowing the if there is a, such an issue of delays between the different components of the biologging uh, device is uh, is important when considering multi sensor biologging devices. So yeah, uh, actually, so uh, this is our device. Uh, sensor device, can you see? Yes. Uh, and so, let's say, uh, yeah, because of the uh, limitation of the uh, camera device, so it has yeah, about uh, three or two seconds uh, delay uh, after we uh, send a command for uh, re recording the video. Uh, and so, how to say, uh, uh, as far as I know, yeah, it is very difficult to uh, shorten this delay. Uh, but so, how to say, uh, uh, for, for example, so uh, we can, uh, how to say, uh, some uh, camera device has a kind of so uh, sleep mo mode. And so, how to say, um, this mode, uh, enables us to uh, quick, quickly uh, wake up the camera. But, but so how to say, it also requires so kind of, uh, en energy. So how to say, yeah, energy consumption is uh, uh, kind of uh, biggest challenge in uh, biologging using small device. Uh, so yeah, because so, how to say, the energy consumption of camera is uh, very high. So, yeah, uh, to, yeah, sorry, uh, and so to uh, solve this problem, so we implement so artificial uh, intelligence on uh, this device. Uh, so, uh, how to say, yeah, uh, yeah, you, using sleep mode or yeah, uh, can uh, consume so en energy. So yeah, it is very difficult to solve this problem. And so maybe another solution is to capture kind of, how to say, a kind of, uh, how to say. Uh, for, for example, so when an uh, animal uh, performs a specific activity, so if we can uh, observe, how to say, characteristics sensor data uh, that can be uh, found just before the activity. I, I think we can turn on the camera uh, before the target activity, uh, but it, it is also a very difficult problem, I, I think. Uh, so because so sensor data observed in natural environment has a lot of noise. Uh, so how to say, uh, yeah, I think yeah, it is also yeah, challenging to catch such a uh, uh, characteristic uh, data before the target activity. Mm. But I think it is also a 
yeah, interesting uh, research topic. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so um, with, the, with, the, with the approach uh, that, uh, that you have used where you were uh, uh, weighting the, uh, the bite size of your, uh, um, of your tree to, to select uh, uh, space efficient trees. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. uh, you, you found that, these, uh, uh, that there are some trees, like for example, this, this tree that you have in, uh, in a figure four uh, that, uh, uh, where, that has this F feature that is very, um, very costly, but uh, so the, um, but the accuracy is basically as almost as uh, as um, um, is uh, as almost as good as with the feature, basically with uh, with with the tree without uh, without this uh, this F feature. But of course, that tree without the F feature was basically less costly. I was wondering if you if you have tested before before like uh, putting everything on your on your device um, a normal like just a, a random forest uh, with and without this uh, this. Um, this variable, this uh, this uh, this feature, um, to to see if you could have if, without looking at the cost, if you could have dropped that uh, that variable. Yeah. So how to say uh, uh, the feature uh, feature if uh, uh, it is uh, sorry I don't remember what, what kind of feature, uh, but so how to say uh, feature if it's just a costly uh, feature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'd say, yeah, we found that uh, it is very uh, useful feature to uh, accurately recognize uh, animal activity. And so uh, I remember that the first one, uh, first, uh, the most useful feature is uh, the feature G uh, variance. Uh, and the second one is so uh, feature F, uh, Kurtosis. And so, uh, so when we uh, construct uh, decision trees using modified random forest algorithm, so yeah, we uh, included the, uh, all the features. But so, how to say, uh, because the uh, algorithm construct uh, trees so that uh, the trees does not include, so, High cost features, so how to say uh, many of the trees uh, does not include uh, feature F. And uh, yeah, of course, so we can find a, a tree uh, that include uh, includes feature F. But so I say uh, because of the uh, capacity of the flash memory, we couldn't implement such a tree a tree on the logger. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. yes, you have answered uh, also my next question, basically on how you have explained how you uh, uh, you went by basically by uh, optimizing uh, the uh, your, uh, yeah, your your tree. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll move on to my next uh, to my next uh, uh, question. Yes, <laughs> that's great. That's great. <laughs> Um, I was uh, really uh, interested uh, in how you um, how you worked out uh, um, and assessed the robustness of the of the activity uh -huh. recognition. It was a very interested uh, uh, interested point of your uh, of your paper, and I actually really liked the the idea uh, to address the fact that uh, so the tag can move, the tag can become loose, but uh, also the environment in which the animal is moving can actually be. Uh, uh, be noisy, so the signal is noisy. So mm -hmm. you introduce the noise um, to train basically your algorithm with uh, um, with, uh, with 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 this uh, with this noise. Um, I think that this uh, that this is important uh, to test and apply also um, uh, when uh, including uh, so that the, the posture the posture of the animal can also be uh, be, um, be be noisy. Yeah. So how to say? Uh... Yeah, uh, as you said, so my uh, main research is so human activity recognition. And so I have to say also, uh, it is also a big issue in human activity recognition. And so, uh, for, for example, uh, I'm now working with uh, to say, uh, manufacturers, uh, so uh, fa uh, factory. And so we observe, so 
uh, kind of factory work by uh, workers, factory workers. And so uh, depend on, depends on the, for example, uh, uh, position of the sensor. Uh, we, we use smart, smart watch. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we use yeah, smart watch to, smart watch to uh, observe so uh, factory work. And so, uh, yeah, depending on the yeah, position of the smart watch or yeah, in addition, so for example, uh, skill level, uh, skill, skill, uh, skill level of the worker. So uh, data collected by them uh, uh, varies, uh, yeah, different, are different. So uh, to deal with this problem, so we uh, include, so kind of uh, smart uh, filtering al algorithm or uh, kind of uh, state of the neural network uh, mechanism. But so, yeah, uh, in the case of uh, this small device, so it is very difficult to uh, implement a kind of state of the art method yeah, because of the yeah, uh, memory limitation and yeah, processing power limitation. So uh, to solve this problem, so we uh, include so artificial noise on training data in, 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 in advance. And so, and then uh, we train the uh, decision tree on the yeah, noisy training data. And by doing so, so we can uh, construct a so decision tree that can uh, process uh, noisy sensor data. Uh, so yeah, by using this uh, approach, so yeah, uh, we can uh, deal with the noise without using yeah, smart uh, filtering method or uh, yeah, state of that yeah, uh, uh, network or something. Yes, yes, very, very interesting. Um, so I have one last question, but uh, I will ask uh, David uh, um, and Grant if they have uh, questions before I ask. Yeah. David, <laughs> David yep. go for it. Yep. Um, yeah, th thanks, thanks a lot and uh, for, for the very nice uh, study and, and uh, congratulations uh, on, on, your, on your work, uh, which I really enjoyed uh, reading and it's it reminded me um, that that some of the very first uh, camera deployments um, on on seabirds were actually made in in Japan or, or in Antarctica by Japanese researchers. And I, in particular, I I, I remembered a paper published in Plus One. I think it's over ten years ago, and it was um, camera deployments on the tropical boobies on Okinawa um, Island. Um, I, I remember at the time being very excited uh, about these, these uh, developments and, and uh, what you did with this paper really makes uh, sense because one of the big limitations, of course, is, uh, is camera lifetime and, and the time it can, it can record. And, uh, and you, sh you show nicely that there are advantages uh, of uh, putting the device on the belly or on the back. Uh, so on the belly, uh, you, it's better for, for filming, especially what the bird is, is eating, uh, but on the back is better for GPS reception. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I was, so, so I was wondering in an ideal mm -hmm. world, whether it might be possible to have a device in two parts, um, mm -hmm. one with the camera on the belly and, and one on the back with the, the GPS and, and maybe uh, whether these tags could communicate uh, with uh, with each other. Yeah, so how to say, uh, wireless communication uh, requires a lot of energy. Uh, and but so how to say, we are also now developing a kind of <laughs> yeah detached logger. So yeah, this is uh, can you see this uh, logger? Uh, this is a camera. Yep. And so uh, this is the main body of the device. And yeah, it is connected with wire. Uh, and so yeah, this is uh, yeah, just a pro prototype. But so how to say, we also have a, uh, how to say, ro uh, longer with ro long, longer cable. And so, yeah, by, by, by using this de device. 
mentioned briefly that um, I was really, really excited to see this paper come out um, for a number of reasons. There are two major advances in here. Um, the first being um, the cameras themselves, obviously, and being able to integrate a machine learning algorithm into a camera or a device that's attached to the back of a bird. Now, the other really interesting advance that I saw here was the development of the random forests algorithm to turn random forests into a lightweight decision-making tool. And so I guess, is there um, that, that process of making random forests lightweight, is that something that's easily applied to other, other fields? Is that, is that a method that can be easily applied to other problems? Yeah, uh, how to say, uh, we uh, originally uh, developed, developed this method for uh, human uh, activity sensing. So uh, for example, uh, we are now using a so smart watch-like device. And so uh, how to say, uh, and usually so it is, uh, connected with uh, smartphone by uh, Bluetooth or something. And so if uh, we want to, uh, how to say, uh, recognize, for example, gesture or uh, activities uh, uh, by using the sensor data uh, from the uh, device, how to say, uh, for example, if a person is doing a very simple activities. So the device, uh, this small device can recognize uh, the device using a very simple uh, process. But so if, uh, for example, uh, if a person is doing very complex activity, uh, for example, doing a factory or something, so uh, it is very difficult to uh, recognize it using a uh, simple uh, process. So I'd say in many cases, so uh, kind of deep model or a yeah, complex model is required. And so uh, in, so to uh, reduce the, I'd say, uh, energy consumption of the device, so we proposed to, I'd say, uh, let's say adaptively uh, process the incoming signal depending on the com com complexity of the in incoming signal. So for example, if a uh, simple uh, activity, uh, simple, simple sensor data is coming, so the device uh, process, uh, process the data uh, on, 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 the on, on the board, and send only the result. And so I'd say, yeah, uh, sending something 
uh, wirelessly requires a, a lot of energy. Uh, so by just sending a result, uh, does not consume a lot, lot of energy. Uh, so if, let's say, complex data is coming, so the device uh, pre-process the complex data uh, quickly and then send the uh, pro uh, processed data to the smartphone and the smartphone uh, process recognize the data using complex model. By, by doing so, so yeah, we can uh, reduce the uh, energy consumption related to uh, wireless communication, but so we can also recognize uh, complex activity at, at the same time. Uh, so yeah, I, I originally uh, proposed this method for person. Um, and so, yeah, I think yeah, we can uh, you, you use this kind, uh, this kind of uh, technique for, yeah, uh, yeah, for some smartwatch like uh, poor devices. Yeah, that is very, very cool. Thank you very much. Um, Mariana, do you have one more question you'd like to ask before we go to the next paper? No, we actually we actually talked about the, the implementations and we saw already <laughs> the new fantastic <laughs> yeah. Uh, prototype. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Beautiful. Well, Tekua, thank you very much thank for joining you. us. That was uh, and, so nice. and congratulations on that fantastic paper. Thank um, you. All right. So we're going to move on now to our next paper on list which is by Gildas Glemarek. And I apologize if I butchered your name with my North American accent. I'll unmute you there. And uh, all right, this one, this one is down to me. So seabird bycatch is one of the biggest threats to seabirds in the marine environment, perhaps only rivaled by things like climate change or in some cases introduced predators. Now, estimates suggest that there are upwards of 400,000 birds every year that are drowned by gill nets alone. You know, just for reference, that's basically the entire population of black-browed albatross in the Falkland Islands. So for those of you, so this is, this is obviously this is a population level problem. For those of you not familiar with gill netting, this is a process where a large paneled net is hung vertically in the water column and left for a period of time to catch fish as they pass the area of the net. As seabirds get caught in this net when they dive for fish that might either be near the net or caught in the net as well. And now bearing in mind, these nets are generally transparent or very near transparent. So uh, very difficult to see. Now, because of the massive impact that bycatch has on seabird populations, monitoring and reporting is absolutely vital towards conservation efforts. In the EU, bycatch reporting is a requirement. However, data are rarely reliable and particularly in the artisanal fisheries. So these are sort of small scale fish fisheries of small boats uh, run by locals. This is because until recently, monitoring was only really able to occur sporadically. As human observers are required, which can either be prohibitively expensive or in some other fisheries in other parts of the world, extremely dangerous. Um, in Denmark, where this study was carried out, commercial gear net, gill netters are ten, tend to be quite small, so less than 15 meters in length. And the national program only covers about 0.1% of the entire fleet. So there's a huge data gap here. So this leaves reporting up to the individual operators where they fill out logbooks and record how much they're catching. And that raises major concerns about data reliability when enforcement is basically next to impossible. Carcass collection and other methods can somewhat help to complete the picture, but broadly, it's understood that the amount of bycatch is heavily underreported. Now, electronic monitoring systems are, have been around since about 2008-ish, uh, and they've been put on fishing vessels to monitor activities, um, and particularly issues around bycatch and otherwise, but these are becoming widespread now. Um, these EM systems allow for the storage of footage and um, on board and thus the ability to revisit the data at any time. Now, until recently, most applications of EM systems have been on large commercial vessels where cameras are, can be sort of easily installed. You can put, you know, big CCTV cameras on large trawlers. Uh, now, the authors of this study decided to deploy some EM systems in the 
Danish artisanal fishery to assess bycatch. And this is a particularly important step forward because of the data gap that exists around bycatch from small fishing vessels. Three gillnet vessels operating in Denmark were fitted with EM systems for this study. And the entirety of fishing activity was recorded with data spanning generally from 2010 to about 2018. Uh, and that varies between the vessels that were, that were tracked. Now these vessels were primarily um, used for cod. Um, they were also catching uh, lumpfish and other similar species. Now these EM, uh, so these, these nets that are placed are, um, are quite long. Um, I think uh, in the paper, it's mentioned that some of these are, are extending up to five kilometers in length um, with the, the entirety of the nets. So these are massive, massive nets. Um, and of course, if, you, if you're familiar with gill fishing, gill netting in other parts of the world, you'll see that in, in Iceland, you can have nets that are, you know, tens of kilometers long or more. Um, now the depths and lengths of time for deployment vary depending on the target species as well. So now the EM systems uh, were, that were used in this study were small CT CCTV cameras that recorded activity on decks from various angles. And what was kind of cool about these is they also had these really nice G GPS receivers on board. So they're, they're collecting more data than just video. You're actually recording where specific activities occur. Um, so actually, and that being said, I did want to share the screen with you to show um, this figure from the paper share my screen again. So you might see here, this gives you an idea for those of you who can see it at the moment. There's, um, there we go. So what you can see here is the output from these, uh, um, these devices. So you're actually seeing the, the actual trawls, where those trawls occurred. And that's these sort of yellow lines here. And then where specific bycatch events occurred. So you can get this really lovely visual um, assessment of overlaps between um, species distributions and, and trawls, which is quite cool. So just wanted to point that out. Also, just keep in mind here as well that look at the study area we're working here is very, very small east coast of Denmark between Denmark and Sweden. So it's a very, very small area that they're working in. So um, now <clears throat> Something that was mentioned uh, is that deep learning algorithms were actually considered in the, for this study initially, um, but there's um, the regular irregularity of the incoming videos posed a serious problem for interpretation by automated methods. Um, so to a large extent, image classification algorithms require standardized imagery to be accurate. And at the time this study was developed, the authors were lacking a robust algorithm that existed uh, to deal with that or a large enough training data set to teach an AI algorithm to do the work. So for the purpose of this study, the machine that was doing the learning was a group of students hired to identify specific bycatch events. Now, I just want to show you again, I'm going to share my screen again one more time. Sorry for jumping back and forth here, but um, I want to show you the kind of imagery that comes in. So if I zoom in, oops, there we go. You can see some of the imagery that gets collected. Um, from the cameras here. And you can see that the birds are in all sorts of different postures. They've got various debris wrapped around them. Um, so it's very, very, you can imagine how even a trained observer might have some issues trying to identify some of these birds. So, um, so that's, that's part of the issue that was brought up here by the authors about why deep learning or uh, machine learning methods probably might not work here, at least not yet. Now, now the authors, uh, used fishing effort, which is a function of sort of net length and soaking time. So how long the nets in the water and by um, to generate these bycatch rate estimates. And these rate estimates are recorded as the birds caught per kilometer by hour. Um, the authors compared the EM data to fishing logs and found that the EM data covered about 77% of all fishing trips by the three vessels and accounted for nearly 11,000 individual hauls. Now from these 11,000 hauls, 700 birds from about six families were identified. However, only over 90% of the birds captured were either, uh, were one of three species, common eider, great cormorant, or common guillemot. And it's important to note that regionally, common eider are considered endangered. 
Now, analysis and the timing of the bycatch, of, uh, bycatch rates found that the highest rates were during November, and that's in, even when accounting for extreme bycatch events. So there was an extreme bycatch, uh, several extreme bycatch events where many birds were caught all in a very short period of time. So even accounting for that, it seemed like the, uh, the, the biggest overlap was uh, during the sort of uh, early winter months. Um, a hot spot of bycatch rates was also detected in the northwest sector of the study area. Um, and so these identify these spatiotemporal overlaps. Um, and those kinds of overlaps can have an immediate impact on conservation initi initiatives. So we know where to look, basically, and where to put in protections. Um, the mean bycatch rate that was worked out um, in this study was about 0.34 birds per trip. And the upper 95% confidence limit of that was 0 0.56. Now, this might not seem like a lot, but let's, if you scale that up, let's say in a worst case scenario, a vessel is taking one bird every two trips. Now you scale that, let's say there's a hundred vessels. So assuming the same rate for all of those vessels and one trip per day, that would be nearly 400 birds per week. So if you scale that up further to say 30 weeks of fishing per year, that would be just under 12,000 individuals taking from, taken from that small area in Denmark. Assuming of course, that there's a hundred vessels around um, to, to pull that many birds. So Gildas, thank you very much for joining us today. And thanks for that very cool paper. Um, it's a very, very interesting um, approach to, to start looking at this in terms of the artisanal fishing. I mean, so where I grew up in Newfoundland, we have a very similar problem. There's loads of, loads of small operators and there's basically no data. And that comes from a combination of um, either you know, lack of education or lack of caring. And so there's, so my first question to you kind of comes around that is sort of like, how, how resistant were the, these fishermen to, to this kind of methodology? You do say in the paper that only 77% of fishing trips were recorded. Now, was this because the, the fishermen were sort of like, oh, we don't want to turn on our cameras or was this more related to, um, more related to uh, the equipment not working properly? Um, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you just yes. fine. Good. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me first, uh, both to answer your question. Um, so for, with the, for the fishes we worked with in this area, so we have many more fishes uh, in, in other areas uh, uh, with which we, we work. For these fishes, uh, we have, a, and this is one of the reasons why we chose that as a, as a case study in the first place, we had very good relationship uh, with, with these particular people. So they were willing to help, uh, at least one, two of them were quite uh, aware of the, the problems of uh, yeah, seabird bycatch and uh, threat to populations. So that, that was quite interesting to work with them in particular. With that said, we had, more issues with one of them who we never really figured if he was uh, having technical problems or maybe forgetting to turn on the the, 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 the power sometimes. Let's just say it like this. <laughs> so we never really figured that out. And you can see, I think there's a table in the paper, I don't remember, I need to check, where we, where we can see that he has uh, less trips recorded uh, on average than others mm -hmm. so yeah um, but again that these are participating fishes and in this case we had um, we had compensation for them so they were also motivated by the money they can make out of having cameras on board right. which is a big motivation for small uh, for, for small scale fishes or artisanal fishes in this case so yeah. I have a lot of things beeping on my computer I'm just turning this off this is super annoying <laughs> there That's a, we go. I can hear that. anything here. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, yeah. I just keep having this ringing bell. Um, okay, I'm good. I'm good to go. Uh, yeah. So yeah, right. No, that, that that's that's interesting. And so following up on that, then, so is it is it financially feasible then to continue putting cameras on vessels if you have to pay these fishermen? I assume then this would have to be some sort of government program. Where the government would have to subsidize um, the the fisheries by you know to allow them to put these cameras on, um, is that something that I I don't know if you're 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 um, 
tuned in to what's going on at the government level with regards to that. Is there any interest in doing that? I am tuned in. Uh, well, that, that's that. Well, two things. First, the this uh, so-called pilot project uh, was merged, moved to whatever something called the the DCF program. So in Europe, you have the data collection framework, which is basically observers going on board and collecting data for fisheries. Uh, the, the bycatch monitoring program using EM has been, you know, is now part of this uh, of this uh, group. And what that means technically is that they are in charge of that, and they have a budget that is a bit higher than just a pilot study, uh, which is good. Now, in terms of compensation, that depends. The government is the Danish government is willing to push and is pushing forward uh, implementation of cameras, but the problem is not really just uh, whether you can uh, get a bit more quota or whatever you I mean, this money can be found or at least uh, additional quotas can be found in general. The problem is that a large, part, a large part of the fishing community is not really wanting to have cameras on board in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that is more of a problem than really having uh, to find a, a bit of money here and there to compensate fishes, because that money you can find if you really have a political decision behind. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's very much a problem in a lot of parts of the world, it seems. Um, so, so okay, so f going further then on um, on that. So how how big is the the artisanal fishery in in Denmark, particularly in that area? Are there you know, a hundred vessels out there. Is there any idea how many vessels there are out there? I assume there's some, yes, there's some estimate. Uh, well, in that particular area, the Ersund, I don't remember. Uh, this is not the, 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 the biggest fishing area in Denmark for, for gillnetters, but uh, gillnet vessels are uh, all around Denmark and it represents, I don't remember, I should find my, PhD thesis somewhere. I have the well. If you want the real numbers, you can find them in my thesis. Oh, that's, <laughs> my <word. laughs> that's a that's uh, a plug for your work right there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it's more than half. I, I don't remember. Out of my, I mean, it's it's in terms of number of vessel, it's the vast majority uh, in Europe in general. I think something like eighty percent. Yeah. Okay. That's small scale. Uh, not just gillnets, but small scale. Yeah. Don't, okay. don't quote me on that, please. Just uh, <laughs> I, make your own. I, I promise, not a not a word. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so the the next thing I wanted to ask you about was your uh, your bycatch detection team here, or what I'm calling your machine learning algorithm. <laughs> so um, you mentioned in the paper that you you got a bunch of unwitting students together to to mm -hmm. do this and hired them on 12 hour i guess it's 12 hour contract 12 hours a week yeah. um so my my question is how many person hours went into analyzing these ten thousand hauls oh i don't i didn't calculate that uh the the thing is they were not working on these three vessels we've had uh 17 vessels i don't oh, wow. remember so, so this is a subset of uh, a larger data set. Oh, wow. Uh, and it also depends on the vessels. I mean, these ones are fairly easy uh, because, again, the, the fishes were willing to, I mean, to some extent, were willing to help. So we could call them and say, hey, look, you know, you have some salt, whatever, crust on your, on your camera lens, please clean it, and they would do it. Okay. They would also help us, not not always, but uh, you know, presenting the bird to the camera, which helps mm. a, a lot, uh, of course. So when you have people that are willing to collaborate, I mean, you 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 save so much time. In other areas where we have uh, larger vessels, for instance, going for longer trips, um, that might be more, more difficult because. Uh, Actually, you were saying that the that the net fleets were impressively long. They are not. You have much, much, much longer uh, net fleets uh, that can be set in other areas um, mm -hmm. uh, with longer soak times, etc. Which means that for the fishes uh, working on board, it takes a long time just to 
disentangle the fish and they couldn't care much about the cameras at some point. So mm -hmm. they're, just, uh, they're just doing their job. And if the camera is a bit dirty, they, they probably don't see, don't see it. Mm -hmm. So in some areas, it's more difficult than in others to work. In, in that one, is, it was relatively easy. So, so to answer your question, how many hours did it take? I, I don't know. I could calculate that probably, but uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's, of course, in, in the machine learning community and the image recognition community, I mean, this is the big thing is trying to tease out the differences between uh, how long it takes a human to do it versus just setting a computer at it. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in, in a little bit, but maybe I'll let uh, Mariana and David ask a question. David looks like he's got a question. I can see that look in his eye. He's got his, he got his pencil up to his mouth and he's thinking. Yes, um, but Mariana raised her hand uh, first, so uh, I think she, she, should, uh, she should go for it. <laughs> go for it, Mariana. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, no, my question is, uh, is again about uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, machine learning power that you had, because I, um, I think this is a common, uh, um, like the problem that uh, you had with, um, with, uh, with, uh, with the video is the problem that we all have when also like when we record uh, images from uh, um, on board of, a, of an animal, like, uh, yeah, the detecting of pre-catching events or foraging in general, the quality of the image that comes uh, that comes in uh, is uh, is at, as it is uh, and uh, like we have the same problems like him like uh, water qu uh, clarity and um, and the light uh, reflection uh, and all uh, and all these things so yeah um, I, I I I understood uh, the like I, co I could see yeah the, the the problem so I was wondering in in terms of like um, implementations like if you if you want to propose to implement these on board of the of of the vessels and then start recording for the next uh, like you will be recording for the next 20 years so you will be collecting lots of uh, lots of images so if uh, there is a, in it's in the plan to to at least try to um, to start to detect to to train some of the images some like the most clear images like to see if something is possible or not uh, it's more than a plan why well, it is definitely a plan yeah um so we we collaborate with this uh, company that's called Uncolab. i'm talking about them in the in the mm -hmm. paper uh, and we used to work for with a canadian company called archipelago and both companies are, have already implemented it's on trawlers so it's on larger vessels uh the camera placement is different it's more standardized uh i mean i don't need to get into details but they already have their own methods both companies and other companies where they can uh, identify the species uh and take length and take length measurements of fish that are for example on a sorting tray and so yeah. based on this for instance you, you see a card you have a length uh, weight relationship so you measure all this is done automatically right so you measure the fish or the machine learning process whatever measures the fish and then at the end of the of the of the hole uh, you have uh, the weight of cards uh, flat place or you know you, yeah or whatnot um, and uh, after some discussions with them it's possible to do that for bycatch i personally would like to see, and I have yet to see a process that identify uh, bycatch, bycatch species or f uh, birds in this case at species level, but I don't think it's actually the big issue here. Like um, in, in, in this paper, uh, we talk about, I think it's zero, it's less than 1%, 0.4 as far as I remember, percent of the holes. So the, a hole is, you know, you take a net up on board uh, there's 0 0.4, 0 0.5, I don't remember, of the holes that have birds in. So if we had a process that could just flag these events or even these holes, and then we could have a, a, a human operator just, uh, just watching the hole and maybe even uh, identifying the, the, the species where possible. So that would already save us a lot of time. Then, of course, you have also, you, you also need to probably add some sort of a, backup you, you you review 10 percent at random yeah. or, or i mean that that can be that can be defined but at least uh, from what i understand because i'm no specialist of artificial intelligence 
uh, but I, I work with this data. And uh, the, the problem in the first place is to have enough data to, 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 to train a process. And the, the, it just didn't exist uh, before. Now we have uh, many thousands to two to, to yeah two thousand something. I haven't I haven't uh, I don't have the last count of birds that we of individual birds that we have identified. So we have at least one picture for each one of these birds, and sometimes more because we're talking about video footage. So you could take uh, each interesting uh, frame within the sequence and have just as many pictures. Uh, well, if they're interested, interesting as you want. And these can be used to train uh, an algorithm that already exists uh, at Anchor Lab. And then we'll, we'll try to apply this to, uh, to our, to our uh, data. So, you know, the, the Fantastic. traditional train, uh, yeah, train yeah. process, et cetera. Yeah, I hope I hope be, before the end of the year, <laughs> no Corona, all yeah. this, yeah, let's yeah, take yeah. time. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> nice. David. Yes. <clears throat> uh, um, yeah, more of a, of a comment initially, uh, because you, you discussed with, with Grant uh, at the beginning uh, this, this whole issue of uh, how do we get uh, fishing units uh, and, and fishermen to install this, this type of uh, video monitoring system on board. Uh, and, I, and I guess, you know, that's a, that's a research topic per se. Uh, you know what? What's what's the actual process leading to this being in place or not? You know there are there are areas, uh, for instance, in the French part of the Mediterranean, um, we we are trying to discuss um, the implementation of this type of of systems, and and what I get so far is uh, is a definite no. Um, so uh, so it's very it's very tricky and it makes you think. You know where where do you succeed and where do you fail uh, in in this process? And and in in my experience, it works out if you've been involved in a collaboration with fishermen actually before there was this whole issue of bycatch and 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 whether you were already in a collaboration where there was a, a sort of sense of uh, joint uh, target and joint destiny about a better management of, of marine resources, etc. Because, um, uh, for instance, the discussions we had in, in, in Normandy and Brittany uh, in, in a similar situation, um, actually fishermen were willing to have these cameras also on small fishing units. If uh, before that uh, we had been all together finding out that you know, there was an issue with the use of marine resources, a bycatch of seabirds was part of that issue, and and then you know everyone was willing to to do something. Uh, where, whereas you know if the cameras come later in the process, where things have become very polarized uh, around the the issue of bycatch, then it's it's much harder because uh, you're facing a fishing community which is locked up um, in its uh, in its certainties um, and. Uh, but the question I wanted to, to ask is that at the end of the day with, with your study, was, was there, um, what were the implications in terms of uh, management and conservation in that area? So what, what sort of um, additional mitigation measures were set in place to reduce bycatch? None so far in this area. Uh, I'm, I'm I mean, I don't think this study in particular has changed uh, the, the, the position or the, the, the thoughts of the managers about, uh, yeah, about this. Uh, hopefully it will, but it, it might not be the area where we have the, 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 the highest problem. You're just pointing out a problem that we face here too, even though we work with most, mostly with fishermen who are willing to collaborate and to yeah, advance science and even conservation uh, to, to some degree. Um, we also work in areas where we have, or we, we, th there are areas where we would like to, 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 to put cameras on board vessels and we, we just can't, or at least uh, we have very few people that volunteer for this. And if we have only one uh, fisherman who, who says yes to having cameras, but you have 10 other fishermen in the same harbor that are willing not to have cameras, they're probably going to, to, 
to see this one fisherman and talk to him uh, out of, of the project. At least we, I mean, um, we, we, we could see that very, very easily. So yeah, you need, you need to have collaboration, you need to talk and you need to, to say in our case uh, that this data that we collect is anonymous and is not going to be used for enforcement. It was yep. not the point, it was never the point, and it was always clear for them that, um, that it will not be held against them in any way. Yep. And I think this trust that we managed to build with them was extremely important. And it, yeah, it allowed us to build brick by brick, actually, the, 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 the data that we have today. Um, now the thing about mitigation, I think, is an, an, an almost an entirely other uh, other point. That this, I mean, mitigation can be either you add some sort of uh, device, or you, or you on on the nets, for instance, to uh, uh, to to scare off the birds. Uh, that's that's one way, or you have some uh, management of the of the of the fishing activity. You could you could have a uh, temporary closures or you know things like this so in this case yeah these data could be useful in the long run if we if we manage to see that uh, in some areas there are uh, bycatch hotspots and some time of the year and that is particularly important in areas where you have bycatch of uh, species that are or populations that are vulnerable uh, that's the case in the baltic for the harbor porpoise for instance that's the case for some, um, yeah, even even yeah, near bird colonies, if you can manage to prove. And, that. and what's uh, but what's the level of uh, social acceptance of uh, of bycatch in in Denmark? Uh, so are, are are people aware of the magnitude of bycatch and and how how does uh, public opinion stand to that? Um, well. Uh, that's an opinion more than a fact about Denmark, but there's a, a paper that was released not long ago from uh, northern Germany, so it's very close, uh, where they, inter among other things, they interview uh, fishers and they ask their opinion about bycatch. And for the, for, for, from what I remember, um, species like porpoise, you know, the cute ones, etc., uh, they get a lot of attention and, you know, people are usually willing to reduce bycatch of, of these cute animals because, you know, you don't want to catch a porpoise. Whereas for birds, it looks like, uh, to a large extent, it's just part of the job. You know, you catch a bird here and there and you, you throw it uh, back in the water, dead. That's about it. Yeah. Um, so at least for birds, and that's my impression, there's less um, of a, yeah, cutelessness effect, can you say that? <laughs> uh, than, than, than at least for, for, for porpoise. And in our areas, we have seals. Um, and well, I, I can probably put seals and great cormorants together. Some fishermen are really happy to catch them. Mm. Yeah, that's what, <clears throat> that's what I was about to say. Yeah. It makes a whole difference whether it's an albatross uh, in the Southern Ocean yes. or an Ida, which is a hunted species in Denmark or a cormorant, uh, which, uh, well, people tend to hate. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I guess that has uh, probably a big incidence on, on whether there's bycatch mitigation or not. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, the, the other thing is that even though there are quite a lot, uh, if you take all uh, fish fishes together, there's a uh, it remains rare. So for, for, for many people, it's not such a big issue because you don't see them that often. But occasionally you see a lot of them cut together and, and if you just uh, sum up all the bycatch that can uh, yeah, sum up to, to large numbers and sometimes also uh, yeah, common gimbals. Yeah. Almost as cute as penguins. I agree. No, that's so right. Much. We said that. We, yes. We forgot uh, about the guillemots, especially mm. since you know their conservation status is uh, yeah. is uh, not good at all in in the area. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, people should at least be motivated because of the guillemots. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, well, you t you talk about well again. I'm sorry. I'm going to advertise my own work, <laughs> but uh, since we're talking about it, mitigation and government, uh, we have uh, a fishing vessel that is fishing uh, lump sucker in an area where we know that there's a lot of bycatch of gillnets. And by a lot, I mean a serious lot. Mm -hmm. uh, lump sucker gillnet fisheries. They're known uh, in all across the Northern uh, Atlantic to, to catch a lot of uh, oaks in general, not just common guillemots. Uh, so we would like to, to have more data from this area because it's quite important. From the data that we've seen, sometimes you catch more guillemots than um, soccer in a net fleet. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Um, Thanks for that, Gildas and David. Um, I'll throw it out to the audience if there's any questions before we close up shop. Oh, we've got one from Julius. Uh, right, please. There you go. Go for it. Hello, Gildas. Thanks for a, a nice paper. Um, I'm from another part, uh, another coast of the Baltic Sea, from Lithuania. And uh, I was uh, some questions related with this uh, EU technical uh, regulations like this uh, European Marine Time and Fishery Fund. And uh, how do you see the development of this? Because there was a proposed uh, CCTV camera on board to, con to collect the DF D uh, DCF data. So, but as I know, lots of countries, they were against this. So do you see a potential of your, of your study that it would be implemented in other fisheries? Well, I, I hope so. Obviously, I would, I would like to say. Um, um, but I mean, it's not up to me, right? I mean, if, if the if there is a political will to push forward camera uh, or EM in general and camera in particular implementation uh, or monitoring, sorry, uh, in, in in fisheries that will move forward. Um, in Denmark, it is uh, it is the, the the will of the government to to do that in in fisheries where we know we have a, a problem with discard, for instance, in nephrop fisheries on trawlers. Uh, I talked to colleagues in Sweden uh, who are also working on uh, some portable systems that can be adapted to very very small vessels, and that could definitely be a, a solution in a, in fisheries uh, or in in countries. Where we where where there's many small vessels, so there's there's both a problem on a technical side and the price uh, or the cost for, sorry of implementation and also the political will and the fishers' acceptance. So yeah, there's the European texts, let's say, and then the, there's the reality of the field that can be uh, quite quite different, and it depends from country to country and culture to culture. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 I was actually, there was a second question about the small vessels, the less than 12 meter size. So it, there is not possible to mount, uh, for example, this uh, permanent uh, cameras uh, on board. And this is the majority of Lithuania that are fisher, uh, fishing on the shallow waters, and we see a, a major impact in this sector. So any suggestions what we see is probably just monitoring our population directly by with the fishermen to collect the data because in other at least in our waters this the smallest boats they are doing the largest impact yeah so any solutions uh, you said you already working on this something some scheme uh, well, not personally, but I talked to colleagues in uh, in SLU. Uh, mm -hmm. I talked to Sarah Koenigsen, whom you know, I'm yeah. sure. So you could call her. She has a project, or they have a project over there uh, that they showed yesterday, that uh, or showed to me at least that that it it, it sounds very promising. Um, it's it's uh, it's a working prototype, let's say. So they they're collecting data using a. It's, it's some sort of a waterproof box in, 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 uh, where, where they put batteries and uh, well, hard drives and they have two cameras uh, that are attached to it. And as far as I remember, you have, I mean, you, you have a couple of weeks of uh, battery time. So you can collect the data for, uh, 
for for this time, then 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 maybe change the system or change or change the the, the batteries and uh, collect the data and and and, and do it again. Uh, the advantage of this is that it's not permanent, no. uh, and it's it's also much cheaper. One of the things also with EM data analysis in this case is that it's very convenient, to say the least, very convenient to have a dedicated software to do that. It's one thing to, to watch videos on VRC, and it's another thing to have a program where you can actually watch the videos together with uh, having the position and the speed of the vessel on the same screen uh, and being able to annotate uh, the, the timeline and, and basically feed the database. So that, that's also a big part of why we, we chose this particular system is that because we had this uh, uh, analyzer uh, or EM analyzer software. Um, but I mean, solutions exist, and I know that in, in Sweden they're working on it. So, and, and I think in, in your case in Lithuania, it would uh, it would be very. I mean, it, it would be very much uh, a, a, a solution for you okay. guys because, as far as I know, the, the vessels over there they're like six, seven meters. Uh, yeah, something, something like so. that, similar size. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very thank good. you. All right, thank you for the question, Julius. I think we're we're run over time now, so I think we'll end things off. Gildas, thank you for joining us. Thanks for that great paper. Um, now, before we go, I'm just going to make three announcements. The first, uh, to remind you that Mariana and I are um, putting together a special session section of the journal Remote Sensing on Machine Learning and Marine Ecology. So please keep your eyes open for that. If anyone uh, is working on a machine learning program um, and they've got a paper they'd like to submit, uh, please do contact Mariana and I about that. And um, Or if you know someone who's looking for an outlet for a very cool machine learning paper, please let us know and we'll, uh, we'll get in touch. Um, my second announcement is uh, about next week. So next week, uh, if anyone is attending the Pacific Seabird Group meeting, uh, we'll be doing a, a special Seabird session on the 26th of February in the morning. So that's Friday, eight o'clock Pacific time, um, four o'clock PM, so 1600 GMT. Uh, so that's February 26th, 1600 GMT. We're doing a Seabird session for the Pacific Seabird Group meeting. So if you're going to that or attending that, you'll see us there. Um, the final announcement, which is probably the biggest one, which is is that the registration for the World Seabird Twitter Conference is now open. So for those of you who are on Twitter or want to be on Twitter, uh, please do head over to, uh, uh, to the interwebs and uh, look for the World Seabird Twitter Conference, the seventh World Seabird Twitter Conference. Um, this is gonna be another huge event we've got loads of new sponsors this year, uh, loads of prizes, registration is free. Um, and it is a fantastic, not only is it a fantastic social event, but it's a fantastic way to get your science out to, you know, millions of people almost instantaneously. I think last year, our potential reach was three or 4 million people or something like that. So, so it's a, it's a fantastic outlet. So with that, I'll let you all go back about your days or evenings or mornings or mid afternoons. If you're drinking a beer, then please enjoy. All right, take care everyone, stay safe. I'm gonna stop recording now and then we can all breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs>